There we go, Lee. Hi, everybody. My name's Sandy Beach, and I'm an alcoholic. And I'll tell you, can't tell you what a pleasure it was to sit and listen to my friend Jerry. Those of you that are new, you're going to find that as the years go by, one of your most valued uh, gifts will be friends who have gone down this path with you because um, you share so much in common. And you'll remember when you first got here and uh, wondered what the old timers were talking about. It sounded interesting and people were sure excited about it. (laughs) But (laughs) you didn't see where it had any relevance in your life. And uh, you'll look back on that and laugh as um, your perspective changes, which it constantly does uh, going down this path. If um, somebody asked me to try and summarize the entire AA program in two words, the words I would choose is let go. That's it. That is the total package of everything is to let go. And that is so counterintuitive to a person who controls their life, manages their life, thinks about nothing but their life, and it leaves us with the sensation there wouldn't be much left for me to do. (laughs) Which would reduce your importance significantly, wouldn't it? Well, that's the point of spirituality, is to reduce your significance till it's gone. And the only significance that is left is God's. And um, so you go, well, geez, the program looks like it's a lot more than that to me. But if you start taking it apart, step by step, you'll find that it's just this endless process of letting go and starting out with surrendering to the fact that you're an alcoholic. And that is not done intellectually. That is done mechanically through pain applied by alcohol. And alcohol just grabs your arm, raises it up behind you, and says, would you like to give up yet? And you go, no, and so it raises it up a little more. You can feel the bones starting to break. And that's how you surrender. It is um, inevitable that it will get worse and worse and worse. And so in a strange way, The glue that holds AA together in some humorous fashion is alcohol. It just sits out there, wandering around, whistling a little tune. (laughs) Year after year after year, just waiting for somebody to come out and go, the hell with that crap. And it'll jump up right out of the bushes out there. There's little half pints of vodka all over the place out (laughs) here. Hey, I feel your pain. Come on over here. (laughs) And it'll look like God's will that that would just appear out of nowhere and... And then it'll start applying the pressure to push us towards surrender and surrender and surrender and surrender. And so each one of us is very familiar with the fact that one way or another, we had to let go of our drinking. And so that was the beginning of letting go. But it's just the beginning. I'm, I'm reminded of a sentence, I think it's in, I've 
lost track of pages over the years. I have all the material, but I don't have it cataloged anymore. I can't tell. <laughs> but it seems to me that this is in the beginning of the third step in the 12 and 12, where um, it's being suggested that we turn our whole life over to our higher power. And um, you know how Bill writes. He writes the point that he's trying to make. He does this quite often he, because he knows us very well. He writes the point he's trying to make, and then he rea- writes what our reaction to it's going to be, which is generally negative. You know what I mean? Like, what are you talking about? And I have to maintain some independence here. And um, he's talking about the struggle of letting go of alcohol and pointing out that that's just the beginning, that there's going to be one thing after another. And in my own case, I remember um, my, you know, I finally, after being in a nut ward and all those things, it, it finally became obvious that I really ought to relinquish this drinking thing to AA and whatever was going on here. But it wasn't too long after that that my sponsor, um, he noticed that I would be broke and then I would have about 30 bucks. And uh, he wasn't quite sure where this $30 had appeared from. And um, I don't know whether he guessed or what, but it was coming out of the petty cash at work on a marine base, which is if you want to be a stickler. (laughs) Is... Technically, <laughs> embezzling. <laughs> and so he um, approached me on it, and he said, um, you know, if you're going to stay sober, you can't keep doing that. You just can't keep doing that. And I said, you can't? No. So all I took out of that was that there was actually two things that you had to give up coming into AA was drinking and embezzling. And so I remember just going, jeez, I, I, I thought it was just drinking. But okay, I'll go along with it. Okay, drinking and embezzling. They ought to call it D-E instead of A-A, you know, drinking and embezzling. And then a number of months went by, and um, he noticed that I had kind of an eye for the girls. And um, he said, you know, i got to talk to you about something. If you're going to stay sober, you can't be messing around having affairs while you're married. Oh, so there's three things. <laughs> and, Three things. Yeah. Yeah, there's three things. And, you know, as the months went by, he was coming up with something all the time. It was just, oh, one more thing that uh, is required to give up. And as the uh, steps unfolded, it became apparent that I was going to do a lot of work inventorying. All of the things that were standing in the way of me and my creator. Well, why was I going to inventory these? And why was I going to run them by my sponsor in order to get a true perspective on each one of these items? It was so that I could be in the perfect position to let them go. Let them go. We're entirely ready to have God remove all of these defects of character. God, God, God. I mean, every time you turn around in here... God, God, I mean, it's, what has he got, a PR guy like the Marine Corps? And, um, you know, 
I'm sort of an action guy. You follow what I'm saying? And letting go sounds pretty passive. You know, you, you follow what I'm saying? It's, it's like, okay, I got the letting go. Now, when do I <laughs> get involved here? <laughs> I mean, it, 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 I, I just come up and I got something, and then you go, what do you got there? Oh, I got a, I got a financial thing, a job. Blah, blah, blah. Give me that. <laughs> no. And then we start. No, no. And then finally, all right. <laughs> Now, this sounds silly, but this is the whole deal. I mean, it really is. Um, if you're worried about something right now, in other words, you, you, it sounds like you end up doing nothing, and I, it, that's because it's a paradox. If something's bothering you today, and you just got fired and you don't know what to do about a job and you don't know what to do and you are really upset about it. And I, I'm not going to do this, but I would ask somebody, okay, come on up here and tell, tell me exactly what it is. Well, I'm terrified about money and I, I don't know where I'm going to find a job and all that. And I said, okay, would you let me work on that for a while? Because I happen to know how to put this into the abundance of the universe. I happen to know how to get the word out. I tell, would you be willing to give me the entire package that you're working on? And if you were willing to do that and just say, all right, and then I wait till tomorrow and you come back, <clears throat> You might very well say to me, you know what occurred to me last night? I really ought to call my uncle. He's uh, got the type of company that I have. I don't know why I didn't think of his name before, but I really think he's the perfect guy for me to talk to about this. So what happened? Because you gave me, I'm just using me as a sim symbol, the disturbance, your channel of serenity can be opened so that your truth can arrive. That's what we're talking about. It is in order to get the answer to anything, we have to stop demanding it. We have to relinquish the need you see, the need or any um, anything other than undisturbed state blocks us from receiving the guidance from our own creator. Because we contain inside of ourselves all the truth that there is. And um, I'm not a source of truth for you. I am a way shower. You can come to me and I can go, this is the direction to go get that. Now, until I'm speaking now of the spiritual principles involved. While we're evolving in this direction, we give each other very specific advice all the time in order to stay alive long enough to have the program work. But what I'm talking about is the whole point of the program is to end up in a state of surrender. And a lot of interesting things happen. Um, and I'm just stream of conscious on, on what these things are. What I've uh, thought about lately when I'm working with people with problems is to sit down and discuss the problem until they see that they don't have a problem. And I got that idea when I was brand new. And I would go to my sponsor with the sky is falling. You remember the sky is falling. It, it, you know, I didn't, it wasn't even a specific thing. I would just come over to his house. What's the matter? What's the matter? Oh, <laughs> I can't 
the dog is going to do this, my wife is going to run away, my children are going to and the colonel at the job, and I'm there, you know, and he'd go through the whole thing. <laughs> or I'd go through the whole thing, and then he'd go, okay, yeah, yeah, I see, yeah, you got a point there, yeah, but on the other hand, your health is starting to return. You've got six months of sobriety. You're making coffee in your home group. People are really starting to like you. They're talking about how happy they are that you're in the group. And uh, I talk to your family, and they see some hope here that this is really coming around. And then he would talk, 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 talk. And then when he got through, I would say, well, if you look at it that way, (laughs) maybe I had it wrong. Maybe I had it wrong. So the problem concerned an incorrect perspective on it. An incorrect perspective on it. Well, how does that perspective get changed? By letting go of the old perspective, which are all of the old ideas that uh, Jerry and I have been talking about in our lives and his story about his dog. What was his dog's name? Patches or something? Yeah, and all they wanted to do was to let go (laughs) of um, these huge animals he was attacking. (laughs) And so there's something inside of us that doesn't want to let go. And that is our self-centeredness, which was being talked about, our selfishness. But it boils down to it is our ego. It is our sense of self that, according to our story, is absolutely necessary for me to continue functioning as an individual. Now, the... It is true that for that individual to keep functioning, uh, I would have to keep behaving in that fashion. But we don't want that identity to continue anymore. We don't, do not want to exist as a self-centered, ego-driven entity, which is what our story is when we get here. And so as we start through this um, inventory and sharing with another human being and then coming into uh, step six and seven, which is um, monumentally important in the program, because Jerry was talking about the absolutes and how frightening the absolutes. Oh, God, we can't get those absolutes here. The drunks don't want to hear about absolute anything. Why don't we want to hear about absolute anything? We want wiggle room. We want wiggle room. We like our favorite expression. What's our favorite expression when we start talking about absolutes and any of this stuff? Remember now, progress, not perfection. Now, that's an out-of-context interpretation of that. Because when we get to step six, it's clear as a bell. That's talking about perfection. That's what the 12 and 12 says. The clear implication of having God remove all our defects of character is perfection. And you know why it's perfection? Because we're not going to remove them ourselves. If we try to, as Jerry said, if we try to become unself-centered on our own, it can't be done. How can you become unself-centered? Even if you're, you have enough humility as a self-centered person to say, you know, these guys are right. I, I really am self-centered. All I walk around, I just think about myself. I, that's all I think about. I mean, when he was talking about walking down the street with his friend and whatever's happening, I, I can remember that. I'm walking down the street with my friend. It's a sudden downpour of rain. And I remember telling my friends about it. I said, boy, the rain came down. I got soaked. And they said, what about Joe? Oh, I guess he got soaked too. 
I guess he, yeah, that's right. He probably got soaked too. He was standing right next to me. I didn't think we both got soaked. I, I got soaked. So then, you know, it gets pointed out, and you go, you know, you're right, I am, that is my, I am self-centered. Wow. What is a self-centered person's reaction to that? You know what, I'm going to do something about that. I'm going home, and I'm going to work on that self-centeredness. I'm going to sit in my little den, in my chair, looking at my pictures on my wall, and I'm going to sit there and work on stop being self-centered. I'm going to say... Sandy, you've got to stop thinking about yourself. Yeah, you're right. I've got to stop thinking about myself. Well, I'm glad you understand that that's the... Oh, I know it's the problem. I'm glad we're in here working on this self-centeredness. And I can report to my sponsor. You know, I spent three hours alone in my room working on self-centeredness. Just sitting there thinking about how I think about myself all the time. And... <laughs> Did anything happen? No, we're probably more self-centered. So how in the world, if self-centeredness changed, there has to be a new center. That's how it has to happen. There has to be a new center, and the new center is God. That's how we become unself-centered. There's no other way. And whenever I talk about that, I always go back to when they thought the earth was the center of the solar system. And, of course, it was the center because that's where I live. (laughs) And the people back then weren't any different than we are. Well, look all around. There's all those other places. We don't live in all those other places. So what do you think the center of all of this is? It's where we are, right? Yeah, damn right it is. (laughs) I don't have to study any instruments or anything. It's clear. We're here. This is the center. And then, of course, as... Anyway, as they start measuring things, it wasn't making sense. And they finally, some of the more astute observers began to realize that all the information that the emperors and the big shots had was wrong. And the trick is, who's going to tell them? They're not going to like it. Because what's going to happen if you're the emperor and you don't even know the center of where you are? I suppose you might look bad. And we ain't having any, well, I'm not looking bad. You're going to die before I look bad. And that's what they were doing. Because that is a monstrous change. Can you imagine that? Suppose you had a, Maps of the solar system. That was your business. This would be bad news for your business. <laughs> Those things would be obsolete like that. The entire arrangement would have to be reprogrammed. I mean, do you understand the difference between the earth being the center and the sun being the center? I mean, you'd have to move everything. And all the thinking that we did and all the We're very important because we're the center. Well, now we're not. How can we get important again? I mean, it was, it must have been one heck of a adjustment to switch over. Well, that's what we have to do. And the second our old ideas, which is one way of saying our story or one way of saying our ego, once they get wind of this, the full implications of making God the center, it doesn't take long for everything inside of us to go, well, if if he's going to be the center, then this is wrong, this is wrong, this is wrong, and I was also wrong about that, and I was wrong about that, and I was wrong about that, and I was wrong about that. Holy cow! And there's great resistance to this new center. But there's those pints of vodka patrolling out there. 
Eve. If it wasn't for them, I would never go through this humiliation of becoming just one of the planets orbiting the sun. What a reduction in importance. And that's what's involved in moving from self-centered to God-centered. Letting go of every single perspective. It calls into question every idea you have on everything. Because all of your previous ideas were put together from self-centered view. That's your textbook. Everything that you looked at was from that old textbook. You follow what I'm saying? Whether this is right or it's better to do this, this is the rules to live by, this is what you should do. Um, my assessment of all my family members, well, I wonder if they're different than I said they were. You see how many old ideas are gone now because we're going to have to look at everything from a new place and let go of thousands and thousands of old points of view about everything. When my parents were having their 50th wedding anniversary, and I've told this story before, my uh, sister, who next month will have 30 years in AA, um, I suppose back then she had 15, maybe 10. <clears throat> and, and it was up in New Haven, and I was in... Um, Washington, D.C., and she was going over the uh, guest list, who was coming, old friends, et cetera, et cetera. And I was, oh, yeah, oh, good, Sue, oh, yeah, yeah. She had a country club, and it was going to be quite a nice event. And she got to one uncle, and I said, oh, no, 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 let's not invite him. Don't even tell him about it. Don't tell him about it. He is so abrasive. Sue, he'll ruin the energy. We're trying to have peaceful spiritual energy at the event. Why don't we just not have him come? And she said, he's only like that when you're around. <laughs> Everybody loves him. He's great. He's absolutely wonderful. Now, if she didn't have, I, I think if she didn't have 10 years, I would have been very suspicious about her assessment of this situation. But since she did, and since I was trying to have a new attitude of open-mindedness about things, and some of the hardest things to have open-mindedness about are old ideas. I mean, the ones that you've had for a long time. They're really dug in. But I said, I'm going to take her... I'm going to assume she's right, I'm wrong. So if she's right, and I run up to him and am happy to see him and all that, he's going to be thrilled. And that's exactly what happened. I ran up and, Uncle John, oh, I'm so glad you're here. Boy, isn't this fun? And I, he did look a little funny, and then he went, yeah, isn't it? A little? And we just had the best time. So guess who was wrong? Now, was I wrong or was my perspective wrong? There's two separate issues. From my old perspective, I wasn't wrong. That's exactly what I saw. I wasn't being malicious. I was reporting. If you would put a lie detector on me and said, is he an obnoxious jerk? I would go, yes, he is. And I would have registered that I was telling the truth. So it had nothing to do with honesty. It has to do with perspective. It has to do with, as Chuck says, a new pair of glasses. So now I'm wearing these glasses, and I say, he's the most wonderful guy in the world. And again, I'm telling the truth because I'm accurately reporting what my world looks like now. My sister helped me make the transition. You see what I'm saying? She helped me to see my uncle differently. And once I saw him differently, then what I said about him was different. I did not 
begrudgingly say, okay, from now on I'll say he's a nice guy. You see, what that would have been the old way. Okay, I'll say he's a nice guy. My uncle's a nice guy, but he's really an asshole. <laughs> he's a nice guy. <clears throat> so in that sense, I would have been trying to go along with truth, but not believing it because my perspective was wrong. Bill writes about um, when we hear about kindness, well, we really ought to be kind to people. And I remember going, why? Oh, I know, because then they'll trust you and you can get stuff from them. <laughs> you know what I mean? I said, well, what is kind? And somebody would say, well, see this movie and see what that guy's doing. He's helping that person. That is a kind man. And I go, okay, I got to study that so that I can act kindly from time to time. Because as a self-centered person, I can't be kind. I have to act kindly. I have to learn what kindness is and behave that way. We had to learn all self-centered or until we let go has no room for the true nature of us to come out because we're not centered on our true nature. We're centered on our ego and our selfishness. So we have no idea who we really are. We have no idea what the core of us is. We just know what we have told ourselves that we are. And then we believed it. And so I had this uncle and I had all these things that when you told me that God was the center, I was going to have to let go of all of them. They just had to individually be questioned for the rest of my life. And my hero, Chuck Chamberlain, he talks about it all the way to his death. What are you doing today? Uncover, discover, discard. What was he really saying? He said, I'm just looking for one more thing I'm wrong about. So I can throw it away. It was just the happiest feeling in the world. What other secret little old idea is lurking down in there that is making my life less joyful than it should be? That is blocking the energy of my creator from flowing out from me. And so we're beginning all this with the very fundamentals of letting go. And at first, they have to pry our hands open to get that drinking problem away from us. But as we see the benefits of letting go, we may have a little more of an open mind and start moving on. And so what is eight and nine? What is that for? What is the most haunting thing we drag around with us? Hardly, it must weigh close to 15,000 tons. The past. The past with all of the stuff we did. And there it is. It's just, yeah, I'm trying to live in the now, but I can't get here. I mean, I'm, I got the now and I got the, for you guys, it may be the 90s. For me, it was the 40s that I was dragging around with me in the 50s. Uh, that's a heavy burden. And so they said, well, we're going to show you how to let go of that burden. Here are the steps that are designed so that you can accomplish that. We're going to list all the people that you harmed. And then we're going to study what harm is from a God-centered point of view and not, you don't know what harm is from a self-centered point of view. <laughs> There's no way you can see harm. It all looked justified to you, so I wouldn't have done it. I had to do it. I have to take care of myself. I have to survive. I have to, uh, it's all up to me. And he's doing the same thing, and so there's only one winner. So what do you think I'm doing? I'm doing it before he does it to me. We're all being honest. It's the only way you could possibly have behaved from that perspective. 
which is why the world is such a turmoil. I mean, it's just a <laughs> room. And it's hard to imagine when you fit, sit back from a spiritual perspective, how could we ever expect peace if we can't get at peace with ourselves? If there's a war raging inside of you, what, how could anybody else be at peace? So what we're doing in here is trying to resolve the inner conflict so that we have peace of mind. I really think peace of mind should say peace from mind. (laughs) Because that's where the disturbance comes from. I used to think it came from all of you, but it doesn't. It comes from me. That's a different topic. Um, And so steps, uh, I would submit to you that steps eight and nine can be put in the category of Letting go. Letting go of the past. Letting go of all of the um, burdens that we're carrying around. Another principle that is totally concerned with letting go is forgiveness. That... That may be one of the um, most powerful things that can be done to achieve peace of mind is forgiveness. When I look at the 10th step and I go, um, what is the essence of the 10th step? The essence of the 10th step is to stay undisturbed and to have a um, cushion of self-restraint so that when the events of the world happen, and it does cause me to lose my connection with my higher power, I immediately make the top priority reestablishing the connection with my higher power. So how is this done? Well, it says self-restraint, honest analysis of what's wrong. How could you have an honest analysis of what's going on in your disturbed moment? Ask somebody else. So I call a friend and I go, look, let me just run something by you. This just happened. I was down at work. The boss came in. He said this. How do you see it? You see what I'm saying? How do you see it? Well, the way I see it, your boss is totally off the wall. I mean, he must have some problems at home to come in and do something like that. Oh, my God, that's totally out of line. Forgive him. (laughs) Follow what I'm saying? The answer to your solution is forgiveness. Or he could say, no, he was right, and then you overreacted. Go make an amend. There's only two things that that are happening so that I can let go of the disturbance and then move on. Once I have reestablished my connection, I'm free to simply enjoy the day and be part of God's plan for whatever is supposed to unfold during the day. And then we get to um, 11 and 12. I can clearly look at meditation and, and prayer as a powerful technique for letting go. I am now trying to get even closer to the power and direction as to how I should live my life. If you look at the wording in the 11th step itself, what does it say? Praying only for knowledge of his will for us and the power to carry it out. It never says, take your plan to him and ask him to help you get it. (laughs) Now, maybe that would work. I'm not going to say that that wouldn't work. And you may get great results from that working. But if you allowed him to choose the plan, you would be happier. Who can think up the best plan for you? You or God? So even if you got just what you asked for, you would still be way short of where you'd be if you asked God to figure out what would be best for you. 
So I don't dispute that God can help people obtain their goals. I would suggest, just this is just my own perspective, that you'd be even happier allowing him to figure out what would be best for you. Just my take on it. So I don't have no quarrel with the idea that you could pray for this and it would happen and pray for this and that would happen. And I think that's wonderful. I just think there's another level of happiness and another level of less willfulness in even thinking up what would be best for me. These are just my own thoughts. And then we get to the jackpot of letting go, which is a spiritual awakening. This is what we've been trying to accomplish the whole time. In other words, in order to move from self-centered to God-centered then, I have to let go of the whole ball of wax. And from that view, I mean, if you just, every time I think back on the um, astronomer's when they were observing the motions of everything and just going crazy, trying to make it come out right with the earth as the center. And then when they said, no, it's really the sun, then they went, yeah, wow, now that I check Venus, that's, yeah, look at this. Well, that worked. Okay, let's check Pluto. Holy cow, it works for Pluto. Holy cow, it works for this. It worked. It, worked. it works for the whole thing. The whole thing makes sense. So, Every problem that I was trying to figure out will be revealed in an awakening. And awakenings are a relative term. I think of it as um, allowing light to come in. And at first, there's just a little tiny crack a light coming through a black window, which is me seeing my first glimpse of a different world other than mine. Mine was the black world that I assembled in my own mind. And some people get a big burst early on like Bill Wilson did. And... um It has to be maintained and it has to be sustained and it has to be sought to broaden, which is why seeking is such a huge part of our program. God couldn't would if he were sought. And so there's a constant level of seeking. But to me, it's important to understand what we're seeking. We're seeking more light. We're seeking more awakening. We're seeking more revelations. I just want more to be revealed to me. And so when I, I look at the big book, I look at any spiritual guidance, the big book is a signpost. And you read it and the book says that way. You follow what I'm saying? So if you come up to me and say, which way should I go? I can't say that way. I said, read this and it'll be revealed to you. Do these steps and it will be revealed to you. Now, granted, while we're going through and we're brand new, we're having people go, oh, don't go over there. There's a cliff. I mean, there are practical (laughs) things that we can say. But the goal of it all is to... Allow ourselves to awaken so that we're receiving guidance. But even there, since we're up against our old enemy, the ego, who does not want to give up on all these ideas that we still haven't let go of, and he will jump in. I mean, the ego is the cleverest. I mean, it's us. Who knows us better than us? How do you get around your own self? We use other people. Bill writes, people of very high spiritual development always insist on checking with others the guidance they feel they got from God. So if people of very high spiritual development, that means that even when we're connected and we're praying and we're meditating, we're liable to suddenly feel 
very strong guidance that we should leave our wife and run off to Guatemala with a 19-year-old. Came, it came right to me. I was there. I had my hands like this. <clears throat> I'd say if your sponsor agrees, take go ahead. <laughs> Now, you know what's going to happen. They're going to go, no, that was your ego jumped in there going, hi, Sandy. Yes, this is God. Oh, good God. You never really talked to me. I'll give you an example how subtle it is. Maybe I did this. No, not here. But um, It's called the ego prayer. Now, a lot of people don't know that egos pray. If they do, you want to be very, very cautious But it looks something like this. God, I'm here tonight to thank you for what you've done for me. You've taken me from the gutter. You've taken me absolutely hopeless, shaking, lost piece of junk in society. And you have restored me so that I now have friends. I have self-esteem. I'm liked in my community. I feel good about myself. I have a job. I'm committed to all kinds of activities. I I never could have gotten here by myself. I owe everything that I have to you. I am so grateful that you have placed me where I no longer need you. (laughs) Thank you for restoring me to self-sufficiency. But I'll take it over from now on. Thank you. That's an ego prayer. Starts out with all of the wonderful words about how grateful I am that you, blah, blah, blah. And it's all leading up to, I get to play now, right? I get to manage my own life in some way. I get to take back everything I let go of, which from the ego's point of view, is the only reason for letting go is to temporarily get all the results so that I can take credit and take it all back later and walk around going, "Eh, it's been a tough struggle, but I made it. I came from down there to up here. You see what? That's not a story that sells very well. No matter where we are, we're simply there giving God the credit for everything. Giving the God the credit for everything. Now, that takes a lot of letting go to ever get to the point where we want to give God the credit for everything. And so um, I guess I've just used up about an hour uh, just rambling on the general topic of letting go. And I never said, let God. Why do I not have to say, let God? It's kind of a trick question. Because in the beginning, I had a very hard problem with God. I had the Catholic crucifix that was ready to get me. And so my sponsor said, well, in your case, why don't you turn it over to whatever will take it? You'll feel something that'll come into your life and start straightening it out. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So in your case, just turn it over to whatever will take it. And, of course, that's what I did. In other words, as I let go, I am now in touch with my creator, whether I believe in him or not. And as the results flow in from letting go... I can explain those results in any way I want. Most of us, I said, oh, all the credit goes to the wonderful force that was available as I let go to enter in and take over my life. Do you know how long it takes to say that? (laughs) And somewhere in the eighth year, I got on an efficiency kick. And I said, God, because that's the common word that is used 
four, the invisible force that somehow comes in when I'm willing to let go to straighten out my life and start working all kinds of things. You mean God? Yeah, well, I guess I guess I do. <laughs> I guess I do. If that is... Yeah, you see, Sandy, that's the word we use for the big, long thing that you were describing. <laughs> so in an efficiency kick, I just ended up going, God. <laughs> and I just assume that you all know I'm not talking about the crucifix that's about to get me and take me down in the hole, but rather <laughs> the power source that restored me to a different perspective and um, one that is so pleasant to look out from. In the beginning, we hear about the perspective from others so that we know it's there. That's what a program of attraction is. We hear what the world looks like from someone who we see is very, very happy. And we go, is that what it looks like? Is that, you know, it's like we're climbing the mountain and we're finally going to get up and look over the top and the first one of us that's up there, you guys aren't going to believe what you can see from a, well, tell us, tell us. We got to still got to, well, there's this and there's that and there's this. And that's what we're doing in AA. We're, we got one hand, one hand, and we're all climbing higher and higher and we're reporting back. Oh my God, you're not going to believe this. So when we have a sponsor and we bring a problem to him, he's looking at it from up here instead of where we are. And he says, from here, looks like you ought to do this. Wow, I never would have thought of that. You know why? Because I'm dumb? No, because you're not up here. As soon as you get here, that's what you'll see. It's got nothing to do with learning anything. It has to do with unlearning and letting go, letting go, letting go, so that the new perspective can come in. That's it for me. We've been sitting long enough. Is, is it that we do questions? or I'll leave that up, up to you guys. Uh, if you've been sitting long enough, I will not be offended if you just decide, let's take a freaking break. <laughs> but on the other hand, um, I'll be glad to entertain. Yes, sir. Okay, talk in there so that Lee can get this brilliant question on tape. <laughs> I'm Steve. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Steve. It's a barn burner. Okay. I'm just wondering um, if you felt the need to make an amends to your Uncle John. And if that well, I, I made it by loving him. I did not. I fe this fit in the category of to do so would injure them or others. And it became apparent that if I had said, you know, all these years I thought you were a perfect jerk. And I'm glad I found out I was wrong. <laughs> yeah, may have been. Um, I think it might have set us back several steps from where we, from the new relationship that we had just achieved. So, no, I never went up and said, I'm sorry, I had those ill feelings about you all those years. My name's Matt. I'm an alcoholic. Um, I was raised a preacher's kid. And one of the things I used to joke about was turning my will and life over to the care of God and ended up being a missionary in Zimbabwe or something like that. Um, I've been around for a little while, and as you, you were talking, when I turn things over and allow God to take those, and he does do better with it than I could have possibly imagined, but I still find myself today fighting, wanting it to do it my way instead of just automatically giving it over. And, you know, how is it, uh, you know, do you get to a point at some point where you say, okay, I know better, you know, I, go ahead and just give this thing to God and let him have it, or do we continue this struggle where we try to control and do what we want to do? That's all I got. That is a fantastic question. And I'm going to refer you to a discussion of the sixth step in the 12 and 12, where Bill writes a sentence called the riddle of our existence. Having been granted a perfect release from alcoholism, why don't we just turn over everything else and be happy as can be? We already were given proof that if you get 100% willing, bingo! Why, why aren't all the rest of them gone? Now, one way to explain it, oh, it's happening in God's time. He wants me to stay a jerk for another 10 years and then... <laughs> 
sorry. It has to do with our self-centeredness and ego that does not want to die without a fight. And every ounce of progress is going to be accompanied with this struggle. And that's why Bill said this is a struggle that we are going to engage in for the rest of the time that we're here uh, unless somehow we can achieve full awakening. But um, it is the legitimate center of why the pro- why all spirituality is difficult. And it was made that way. I mean, you've got to remember that this is not something that we put together. And I'm really, so I, I, when I think about these things, I'm kind of weird. So I try to imagine, well, what was God putting, why did he put it together this way? Why did he make it this way? And I think he made it this way so that we would appreciate it so much when we finally achieved it. If it was easy, it wouldn't have the value that it has when you really hang in there until you awaken one more degree. And then you go, yeah. And so I I think it serves a wonderful purpose that it is going to be that way all the way. And that we still go, okay, but I'm still going to try. <laughs> My eyes are going to stay on perfection till the day I die. And I'm going to keep going and I'm going to keep going. So that's a terrific question. I mean, that, that right in the center of our program. Peter, alcoholic. Peter. Sandy, can you comment on the phrase, is it odd or is it God? What's that? Is it odd? Or is it God? Oh, well, Jerry already was talking about that. Is it God? Is it God? Um, I think I read as much about the universe as I read about spirituality because I, I find I'm reading about the same thing. And I love reading cosmology books. I, I can't possibly understand completely what these brilliant scientists are talking about. But it's important to understand the facts to the best of our ability in order to make up stories about them. (laughs) Now, you're going, what is that? Now, when I say make up stories, I'm not talking about making up a story about whether I stole the banana or not. I'm talking about the only way to explain spirituality is through stories of fables, parables. When we tell us our story about how I used to be a hopeless alcoholic and look at me now, we just told a spiritual story because all you can see is God's work. You go, the only way that could have happened to that guy <laughs> is if there is a God. And so the stories of the universe, I'll t- um, no, I'll tell you this story tomorrow. It fits into that. Thing. And so um, the, I'll give you an example. The latest, uh, there are some cosmology writers who are now trying to work in the stories because the, they say that scientific knowledge has advanced so far beyond our last set of stories that we need new ones. And this team uh, attempted to do that. And let me just give you an example. They said, um, here's one way to think about you as a human being, man. It took six billion years for the universe to produce the elements that you're composed of. Six billion years before stars exploded and (laughs) collapsed and did all the things to produce the elements that came through the uh, cosmos to earth so that you could be created. So if you really look at it and you want to know what you're made out of, you're made out of 10% hydrogen and 90% stardust. Now see, all I did, or they did, and I'm passing on to you, was take the facts and make a story out of it. A picture So that we go, wow, 
I like the new facts. I like that that's how it happened. That feels good. I have a new sense of myself that I am, wow. And, and, and that's what I think is very important. And so is it God or odd is, is, is a way of saying is, it, is there really a God? And my favorite of all in that particular discussion is this. And it goes back to when my sponsor did when I was brand new. And I didn't want anything to do with spirituality. In other words, if you're a scientist, you should be willing to get a laboratory and go in there and perform experiments before you shoot your mouth off. Would everybody agree with that? You can't just go out there and go, me, 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 me. I want to see the experiments. Okay, good. So my sponsor called me in. You guys have heard me do this. And he said, um, listen, Sandy, you've been sober about nine months. It's absolutely essential that we take us. I want to know what's going on inside you. I want to know a spiritual inventory about you, okay? Yeah. Okay, how much do you really... Did I do this the other night? How much do you really pray? Okay. How much do you really pray? And I said, you want to know? Okay. None. I think it's stupid. During the Lord's Prayer, I go, <laughs> I, do, I don't, th- Bill, it's the stupidest thing in the world. Hello, 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 hello. It, I, it's, it's just... I don't do any. That's all right. I'm not going to judge you. I just want to know. Okay, so zero pray. Okay, fine. <laughs> um, how often do you go to church? You go. Churches are very spiritual buildings. You, you're in there. It, it has an effect on human beings. It's very powerful. I said, no, no, I don't go to church. I don't even tour churches in Europe. Church, it makes me sick. I'm not interested in it. I, I spend no time. I never ever go. Oh, fine. It's all fine. Fine. Zero churches. How about spiritual books? Throughout history, there have been incredible writers. There's whole sections of spirituality that has inspired people, caused them to see things different. I said, I don't even go near the New Age section. I'm not interested in it. I had the Bible once. It's just a terrible thing. It made me feel sick to my stomach. I read, um, I like mafia uh, stuff is what I really like. <laughs> okay, so zero spiritual reading. Now, last, how about meditation? You sit quietly, allow this. Bill, I don't do that. I'm busy. I got stuff to do. I, I got a lot of thinking. I got, I, I'm too busy. I don't. What, what, wait, why would you sit around and not think? It's just the stupidest thing I ever heard of. So, okay, so forth. One more question. So, how's it going? There's only one place that a spiritual experiment can be performed. This is where the rubber meets the road. It'll never be out in some buddy writes a book proving the existence of God. It's never going to happen. So uh, there's only one place, laboratory, to perform this, and that's inside of you. The human being is the only laboratory where this experiment can be performed And he was having me share the results of my experiment. (laughs) The non-spiritual experiment. Let's pour zero, 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 zero. Okay, what's going on in the lab now? Oh, it's awful in here. I hate it in here. I can't stand it. I'm afraid I can't stand me. I'm going to cry. I'm going to cry in here. Okay, well, cry. Now, we have another experiment. In these steps. And we'd like to use your laboratory with you as the scientist. You can't ask for better terms than that. You're the only one that's going to do the experiment. And you're the only one writing down the results. And we're going to trust you to report back to us. Now, how could you turn that deal down? 
And guess what people say? <laughs> Why would we not want to do that? Right in our literature. We recoil from prayer much as a scientist who refer, refuses to perform a certain experiment lest it prove his pet theory wrong. What is the greatest fear the ego has about praying? What if it works? <laughs> I'll be wrong. I'll look like a jerk all these years. I've been going, ah, that's crap, that's crap, that's crap. <laughs> and all of a sudden, I'll be happy walking around. Yeah, it's great, it's great. I'd rather be right than happy. <laughs> so, I simply say that if you will perform this experiment as a scientist and see what the results are. Now, when you report back the results, does that conclusively prove odd or God? Or does everybody have to conduct their own experiment? Everybody has to conduct their own experiment because I can't prove it for you. You can look at me and go, God damn, it really does seem to work. And maybe I will perform that experiment. So that's my long, long answer to, is it God or not? Hey, Sandy, I got a quick question for you. Sonny beats alcohol. Hey, Sonny. I just want to know, is that duck an alcoholic? <laughs> <laughs> Lee, let's put that we have a question that can never be answered. Is that duck an alcoholic, the one that's sitting on the, on the side here? All right, are we almost there? All right, no, we're not. Thanks, Sonny. I'm Mike. I'm an alcoholic. You know, the, the ego you talk about, it's such a, uh, a tricky thing. It, it, you know, trying to rid oneself, deflate the ego. You know, what I find, and how do you deal with the fact that I, I feel like my purpose here is on earth is spiritual growth. And... When I start growing some, in terms of letting it go, my ego wants to step in and go, look how good I am at letting go. So the separation from the ego, even in spiritual growth, is so difficult, I think, because my pride wants to step in on anything and take back control. How do you deal with that? Could I ask a favor that I answer that question on the lecture Sunday morning? Certainly. Because it's... It can't be answered in five seconds or two minutes, three minutes. But that is the heart of the Sunday morning deal, okay? Thanks. And then if you have a question after that, then are we there? One Hi, more. Kevin O'Neill, alcoholic. La the last one. Uh, I heard you say you have six children. And uh, the topic of uh, today's uh, discussion is letting go. I don't know if you can experience if you experience this, but perhaps you can share your uh, uh, your experience. I have four children, and I find that going to meetings uh, in church, uh, bringing meetings into treatment centers, working with sponsees, I feel like I can let go. I can feel spiritually centered. But as soon as I walk in the door, I'm wrapped around the axle. Four kids, nine, eight, six, and five. And it's, you know, you know the, the wheels fall off. So, uh, and I pray to let go, let, ga let go of the outcome uh, and just live in the action. Uh, what's your experience with that, please? Okay. Um, without the four kids, letting go is just a theory. <laughs> <laughs> so, I look at it this way: with with all the things that I encounter, that I want this, I want this to happen, I want that to happen. In order to have it happen, I need a classroom where I can learn the lessons and and, and actually have the adjustment made inside. So every time they're yelling for this or doing for that, you are forced to become more flexible. Now, it doesn't look like God is shining down going, I'm going to turn you into one of the most flexible spiritual beings you can imagine. It looks like, I can't believe this is happening to me. But that's precisely what's happening. 
you have to become more flexible and more and more and more. And then teenager, I can't believe, I, you know, you're, the level of acceptance is here, now it's out to here, now it's out to here. And then I had two daughters who became alcoholics, and then you have to accept all the stuff that they're going through. And um, so how else could you take your level of acceptance out that far without adversity? Okay, we're at the end of the time. Thank you, guys, and we'll have a nice lunch. And, uh,